Scripture reading this morning is an awesome one. <laughs> comes from the book of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And we'll go some other places from there, but that's, uh, that's our basis this morning. John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. You might recognize something in, in there a little bit. Here begins that particular reading. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him isn't judged. Whoever doesn't believe in him is already judged because they don't believe in the name of God's only son. This is the basis for judgment. The light came into the world and people love the darkness more than the light, for their actions are evil. All who do wicked things hate the light and don't come to the light for fear of their actions will be exposed to the light. Whoever does the truth comes to the light so that it can be seen that their actions were done in God. This is the written word of God. For the people of God, thanks be to God. There once was a man named Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. He was a Jewish religious leader. And he probably knew the Hebrew Bible quite well. He sought out Jesus one night in the darkness to speak with him. And it is important to remember that the theme of light and dark plays a huge part in John's gospel, basically stating that those who follow the light or are in the light believe and follow Jesus. This is presented to us in the prologue or the first few verses of John's gospel what came into being through the word, that is Jesus, was life. And the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. So when we read that Nicodemus comes to see Jesus at night, it's already not looking good for him. <laughs> And then Nicodemus tries to impress Jesus by calling him rabbi, teacher, and then letting Jesus know that something that Jesus already knew, and that was that the Jewish religious leaders thought they knew who Jesus was, but they did not. They thought that Jesus had come from God, and this was evidenced by the signs or miracles that Jesus had been doing. <laughs> I got to admit, I, I kind of got a soft spot in my heart for Nicodemus. I mean, he must have felt that there was something special about Jesus. But just in case someone might see him, he arranges to meet Jesus at night there is a very good chance that he would have been banished from the synagogue if he had been seen with Jesus, unless Nicodemus was strongly questioning the theology of Jesus, which, as we know, happened with the Pharisees quite often. Anyway, Jesus saw right through him, and he seemed to sense what Nicodemus wanted. 
for he ignored Nicodemus' attempt to impress Jesus with his knowledge, and he just gets right to it, saying, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it is not possible to see God's kingdom. Jesus, therefore, answered Nicodemus before he even had a chance to ask. And then Jesus and Nicodemus had a conversation about what it meant theologically and spiritually to be born again. And Jesus is really disappointed that Nicodemus and the rest of the Jewish leaders do not get it. The story of Nicodemus immediately precedes today's passage. After their conversation, Jesus then begins a monologue that will continue through the end of our passage. Please allow me to read it without any breaks, which will hopefully bring out John's meaning as Jesus asked Nicodemus. Nicodemus said, how are these things possible? Talking about being reborn. Jesus answered, you are a teacher of Israel and you don't know. I assure you that we speak about what we know and we testify what we have seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the human one, Jesus. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him isn't judged. Whoever doesn't believe in him is already judged because they don't believe in the name of God's only son. <laughs> I'm just... Uh, I'm just asking myself, can't we get some cards made up with that expanded version of John 3.16 on them? It might be a bit long for a sign or at a football game or a billboard, but there are times when I would just like to pull that out and read it. <laughs> it makes me wonder. Earlier this week, Miss Mariana Roach ask us, those of us who follow her on Facebook, what it is we wonder about. Well, Mariana, here's mine for this morning. What would things have been like if Nicodemus and the other leaders took a leap of faith and believed Jesus, followed him truly and completely without fail? What would John and the other apostles had done with that? And really, as we read the rest of John's gospel, we know Nicodemus does continue to believe in Jesus because when it came time to bury Jesus' body after he had been crucified, it was Nicodemus who helped Joseph of Arimathea prepare Jesus' body. Nicodemus had believed secretly. Well, getting back to our passage, Jesus reminds us of that great story from the book of Numbers in the Bible where the Hebrews, after they had been freed from slavery in Egypt, they were in the wilderness now and they were following Moses and Ah, they began to get tired of this whole thing. They were grumbling and complaining that they, have, they were being mistreated. So the Lord sent 
poisonous snakes among the people and the snakes bit them and many of them died. And then, if you can believe it, the people spoke to Moses and confessed that they had sinned against the Lord and Moses. And would Moses please ask God to take away those snakes? <laughs> the Lord then had Moses fashion a bronze poisonous snake and he attached it to a pole. The Lord said that whoever is bitten can look at this snake on the pole and they will live. That which would save them was lifted up where they could see it and live. And now in the wonder of John's writing, John has Jesus as the one who will be lifted up and everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And then comes a verse that some of us may know. We may even know it by heart. It's John 3, 16. And I'm gonna give us all a chance to recite it right now. And let's do the King James Version. And that includes all of y'all on Facebook Live because we've probably learned it from that King James Version. Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Excellent, wonderful. When God shows God's way of loving the world, this is how God goes about it. And that very next verse for me, for years now, has been right up there with 316. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Hosanna, please. <laughs> In two weeks, it will be Palm Sunday when we celebrate Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem for the last time. And as he's riding along on a donkey, those in the crowd shout, Hosanna. In Hebrew, Hosanna means save us, we pray, or pray, save us. I just want to put that in parentheses right there in John's writing. But that the world might be saved through him. Hosanna, please. This world needs saving. Today's world needs saving. And we ask Jesus to do just that. But how would that work, really? Sure, Christians would be saved. But what about the rest? We often say Jesus came to save all people. How, how does that work? I mean, what about the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Muslims and the Jews? I think maybe for the case of the Jews might be a bit different because God made covenants with the Jewish people that God has not gone back on, but for the others, what is their fate? Is their God our God? Well, in the case of the Muslims, the answer is yes, and for them, God is called Allah. For the others, though, where are they in Jesus' statement? Whoever believes in him, Jesus, isn't judged. Whoever doesn't believe in him is already judged because they don't believe in the name of God's only son. Tough. A friend and I were talking about this just last week and I was reminded of another statement from Jesus that bothered me for some time. When Jesus says, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And when I thought about this, I finally led myself to believe that there is so much about Jesus, the Christ, that I do not know. And that somehow Jesus allows salvation to be available for all peoples of all faiths, people of no faith. And all of this stayed on my mind and my heart. And and then I remembered a book that Adam Hamilton wrote several years back called Christianity and World Religions. In it, he brings to light the beliefs of five of the world's major religions, including Christianity. And he goes into his understanding, admittedly, object, not objectively, because as a Christian, <laughs> his understanding as to how people of other faiths could have salvation through Jesus Christ. Reverend Hamilton asked us to simply recognize that while the merits of Jesus Christ's death are essential for all persons to enter heaven, it is up to God to apply those merits as God chooses. So, if anyone, for instance, a faithful Hindu who has never had the opportunity to know Christ, if they were admitted to heaven, the gift of salvation would have been possible because of Christ's work on the cross. God could choose to give this gift of salvation to someone based on his or her faith. Even though the individual did not know to call upon the name of Jesus, those who hold to this view would note that we all will one day stand before the Lord and every knee should bend and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, with all of that rolling around in our brains, maybe we can expand our own understanding of the fascinating Jesus in John's gospel. Jesus closes his lesson for us today and for the people of the world as he explains the basis for judgment. And it is from these thoughts that I came up with the images on the bulletin. If you still have one around, you might want to pick it up. Those of you at home, maybe you printed it or it's still on your screen. Jesus says that the light came into the world. That being Jesus and his way of life and love. But people loved darkness more than the light. Now, on the bulletin, you will see a mostly black picture with just a spot of white. Perhaps that is how those who do wicked things view the life and love of Jesus. For they have become comfortable there, and they are actually afraid of being exposed to the light even though it would save them. And then the other picture, all white with just a speck of darkness. Perhaps those are the ones that Jesus says does the truth. They have become aware of the light and their actions are done in God. These are those who have realized through the examples of others maybe through a praise song or a hymn or a Sunday school lesson sometime, they realized that they must look up to Jesus, the one who can save them, the one who is lifted up on the cross, lifted up in resurrection, in ascension, and in all of these, the one who is lifted up in glory. 
and in the salvific name of Jesus. Amen. In a moment, we'll be standing here in this room for our invitation hymn. As we prepare to do that, I would like to offer an invitation for anyone here or online that would like to join this wonderful family of faith to get in touch with me. We can make that happen. If you would like more communication about who we are, what we do, what we believe, you can get in touch with me. I can get you that information. I'd love to talk with you on the phone or meet you somewhere. Or if you just need to talk, please call. So now let us stand as we sing. Prepare for our benediction this morning. Let us pray. Dear God, you offer us an amazing grace that is greater than our sin. Even though we may try to refuse it, thinking we're not worthy, allow us to accept it so that it will be evidenced in us as the light of your Son, Jesus, whom you gave to us. This light breaks the power of sin and darkness. God, may we continue to give you praise for the great things you have done. By your grace, by 
by your grace, you give hope to all the world. Amen. Thank you all for coming. I love you all.